Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number one, no, 236. Wow, we've done a lot of these, haven't we? As always, a little bit to tell you about before we get going. Last episode, I had mentioned Karen McBride's webinar, and I kind of jumped the gun on that because I didn't have a link ready. But now in the show notes, you will find a link to Karen McBride's webinar coming out this Thursday, March 18th. I got a preview of it the other day. She's incredible. Her shop is incredible. Her story is incredible. I'm jazzed about this webinar. We're going to jump right into a show. It is Mike Pekovich, Barry Dima, and me. I just want to remind everyone, if you're uh, stocking up on abrasives, head on over to maverickabrasives.com and use the code FINEWOODWORKING to get 10% off your order. Thank you to Maverick Abrasives for making this podcast episode happen. As always, thank you to everyone who subscribes to the magazine and the website. It's a great way of supporting this podcast. Another great way of supporting the podcast is by supporting our advertisers. Super quick note, right at the end, again, somebody's recorder fell on the floor. Not going to name names. Yeah, you did. Thanks very much. The audio gets a little weird again. We'll get it right one of these days. All right, on with the show. Mike, you know anybody who would want to buy a nine-inch bandsaw? Eh? Uh, eh? I don't know. You were the only person I would <laughs> no. say yes to that. Uh, no, well. Well, you've got 20,000 people who are at your disposal. So one of them wants to buy a bandsaw with a Pekovich Woodworks sticker already. It has such good stickers on it. <laughs> like I would, it has really good stickers. And the placement of Lost Art Press, mwah. Pekovich Woodworks, and it's, ben, it's bench top, Kellogg. right? Yeah. It's, so you could actually, it could actually be a desktop bandsaw. You just keep it at your work desk okay. as a little <laughs> trophy. A little momentum. That's, that'd, be, that'd be great. Yeah. Like how people used to put like where they travel to on their briefcase. Yeah. Just, so. That's my bandsaw. Yeah. For the woodworker who needs to work from home. Yes. <laughs> For the woodworker who needs to do some band sawing while they're working from home. Yeah, just a little scroll work. Just to like the day. off the camera during the Zoom meetings and just <laughs> mute your mic. And I think it's a pretty small club of ours. Just all of a sudden I do this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump into question number one. All right. Deal. Uh, This one is from Brian. Reading the article from November, December issue uh, 2015 titled The Enfield Cupboard, updated (laughs) by Matt Kenny, generated a question about joint choices during case construction. Matt dovetails the subtop, but uses standard dados for the rest of the shelves. Since the dovetails are hidden, I'm assuming that he did this for strength. Uh... Why that joint up top, but not sliding dovetails for the bottom? Maybe this is a broader question about why you choose different joints for case construction. This I'd, one got in because you emailed me, I think, yesterday, and you're like, this is a great question. Oh, fine. I was going to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know. <laughs> um, no, th- this is a, a really, really good question in that the notion that um, you know a joint has to be super, super strong. Otherwise, you shouldn't use it. And a, a connecting like a, say, a shelf in a bookcase uh, to the case sides with just a dado, um, it has a lot of like sheer strength, meaning it does a good job of aligning the shelf top to bottom. It can do a good job of um, setting your distance between the sides with the shelf. So that's all good. What it doesn't do a good job of is actually, as uh, this person noted, doesn't really do a good job of keeping the sides attached to the shelf because the glue surfaces each every glue surface is a combination of a long grain edge and an end grain end so while there's some glue surface it's not really locking it down um, and especially if your data is a little bit shallow so does this mean it's a bad joint to use for case construction um, the I, the answer is no depending on how you're combining it with other joints Uh, So, for instance, on an infield cupboard, um, so the shelves are connected to the sides with just a dado, but there's also uh, like a face frame style, like the front legs um, are basically a a style which is glued to the case. And by gluing it to both 
the case side and the shelves, that's locking that joint together really, really well at the front. And then there's also a frame and panel back, which is rabbited into the case sides in the back. That's also tying everything together side to side. So it's a really good um, example of how you can use simple joinery that might not be, you know, provide the strength you want on its own, um, but in combination, it can do the job really, really well. So why would you ever need to use a sliding dovetail or taper sliding dovetail? I would say that's when you're bringing case parts together without a face frame. So without any supplemental weight to hold things together. So let's say you're doing a dresser um, or even a bookcase without a face frame. I think that's where you probably want to use uh, sliding dovetail or tapered sliding dovetail. The difference between the two is, you know, a, a regular sliding dovetail um, has a consistent width, key, and slot. And the problem with that is in order for it to actually slide easy enough to close, any gap in a dovetail joint um, reduces its mechanical strength to hold pieces together. So if it's loose enough to slide, it's probably too loose to actually mechanically clamp those pieces together. So then you go through that hassle of creating a sliding dovetail, which means you have a tapered key and tapered slot. And as you put that in, it starts loose. And then right when it seats, it, it, it locks everything down mechanically. So, um, that to me is, is the issue is that you can reinforce a dado, which is super easy to cut. Um, or you can forego that and go with a tapered sliding dovetail, but to go halfway in between and just go with us with a regular dovetail joint or sliding dovetail that's not tapered, I think that's where you're adding a lot of work to the process without really getting any benefit of that added work. So, so Chris Gochner did an infield cupboard video for us okay. and he did tapered sliding dovetails for the shelves. All right. And I mean, I'm telling you, you could have used this thing. You could have parked his truck yeah. on it at the end of, of him constructing it. I can't imagine a more sturdy construction than dovetails up top, tapered sliding dovetails, you know, holding the shelves in. It just, and then the face frame added to it. Yeah, it's like wearing two pairs of underwear, though. I is yeah, <laughs> like why? I don't necessarily see the point in it. And honestly, an, an Enfield cupboard is on my short list of projects. And Barry knows that I might be just to tick people off. I might do the case construction with pocket screws or dowels at the at the most because. I want to build the piece. And I think that the face frame and the back are going to add so much strength that dovetails for the subtop um, are just absolutely unnecessary. That's me. Um, yeah. I mean, one, not to discount Chris, cause he's an awesome woodworker and instructor. It could be a situation where it provides an opportunity to practice a taper sliding dovetail. Yes. And the other thing that tapered sliding dovetail is going to do is it's going to hold those case sides flat for their entire width. So okay, rather than yeah. tacking them together front and back, this is also keeping that side from potentially bowing out in the center and maybe at some point. So, and I'm um, oh, sorry, go on Mike. No, that's about it. I'm not sure that a tapered sliding dovetail is much harder to cut by hand. Like, not four times harder. It might take two times as long. But if you're, because Chris did the infield cover by hand. And so, short yes. of having a dado plane to just plow out that mess, because I think right. he saws and chops it, right, Ben? And then takes a router plane to it. Yeah. I'm not sure it's that much more work by hand other than, than the need for the dovetail plane at the end for yeah the but shelf. that's just otherwise you'd be using what like a, a moving philister and that's just kind of like a dovetail plane not at a dovetail angle you know what i mean well no i'm saying you could do dados with 
your ordinary average set of hand Oh tools. yeah, you do need specialty tools, yeah. With a sliding yeah. dovetail, you do need a dovetail plane eventually. Or Tim Rousseau uses what is it like a, a ninety a side rabbit plane with an angled fence? Not side. Yeah, yeah. And I think he, yeah, uses, he uses an edge trimming plane. There you go. There you go. Was that yeah. it? Was it, it ever? But yeah, but I think is that for tune up or does he do the whole joint with that? I think he does the, the joint that way. No, um, he did joint. He routes it, and then I think he uses that to fine tune the fit. Uh -huh. He did a great article on sliding dovetails, both through sliding dovetails and also stopped where. The, the uh, slot stops before the front edge and the key is trimmed off. So it's really clean from the front. Chris or Rousseau? Uh, Tim Rousseau. Oh, we did? Uh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, by hand buried, then you still have to figure out how to create the key on the end of the shelf as opposed to a dado. You're just sticking that thing in there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. If your dado is the the width, if it matches the thickness of your piece. Right. That's true. I'm thinking like yeah. a lip. But yeah, you're right. <clears throat> not a lip a rabbit let's use woodworker terms yeah. <laughs> and then also so uh back to the the half line dovetails at the top of the case on matt's piece i did the same on my chimney cupboard um which came out before matt's piece and it's very similar but um they're both very nice um i have since then on occasion yeah you can replace the half line dovetails at the top with just uh, a um rabbited dado so you run yeah. a dado you know say a you know, a quarter inch in or half inch in from the top. And then you run a little tongue in there. And again, it's not super strong, but it holds everything together really well. And I kind of like it for that piece because everything else is just rabbits and dado. So it's super simple construction. So then to then say, oh, and then throw some half blind dovetail case construction in there. It just feels like you're breaking the spell a little bit. It's like, oh, this was super easy, but now you just threw something at me that I really don't feel like doing. So if you want to wrap a dado at the top of the case too, go for it. And if you want to dovetail everything, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. How, do it however you want to do it. I'm doing a shaker wall clock now and I'm following more like I'm following more or less um, Bexford's plans on it. And he does the case. It's all just butt jointed. And then when he screws on the top and the bottom, that locks stuff together, mm -hmm. you know? And I was saying, nah, I'm going to dovetail this, you know, in part because I wanted to dovetail it, but also I didn't have to then worry about a very fragile pine piece. Sorry, not pine, a uh, butt jointed and glued piece that like then I then had to screw the top and bottom onto. I think, no, I can just glue the top and bottom on and. I don't have to worry about plugging holes or anything. It just seemed, I guess dovetails is more work than plugging holes, but it was a, no, I want to do dovetails here because mm -hmm. in part it would aid with assembly and because I wanted to do dovetails, you know? Um, so this probably for 10 years, this has kind of bothered me. It, the idea of, so end grain and long grain glue up or side grain glue up. A rabbit gives you no extra side grain. It's still an end grain glue up. What do you mean? Explain. So a rabbit <clears throat> joint, you still wind grain? up with, with, with side grain touching end grain. Um, depends on the orientation of the parts. It, like if you wrap it a case side and you drop a case back in, all that grain is running vertical. Yes, absolutely. But on a case glue up, yeah. you know, if 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 you did a rabbited uh, joint for the subtop of an Enfield cover, yeah. well, it's a rabbited it's dado. Really, yeah. Okay, now a rabbited dado, I think you're getting mechanical advantage where there's a trapped board, right? A little bit. Um, there is but just a straight up rabbit. It's, oh, I see. it's a, it's a little bit stronger than a butt joint glued together. Right. But yeah, I mean, joinery, we tend to think of joints in terms of glue strength or mechanical strength. Um, yeah. A really important function of a joint is alignment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So okay. a rabbit is going, as opposed to a butt joint where you're putting the top in and you're trying to keep that alignment top to bottom, at least a rabbit, you can sort of sock it down to that shoulder mm -hmm. and that's going to hold it pretty well. So I, I think that's a good benefit. Um, the other thing I talked about a rabbited dado, um, of course, at the top, because you're so close to the edge, you have to do that. 
But if I am connecting shelves to a case side, um, rather than just doing a dado in a full thickness shelf into that dado, I typically do a rabbited dado, meaning the dado is slightly narrower than the thickness of the shelf, and then I have to rabbit the shelf to mm -hmm. fit. That's got some really good benefits. Number one is you don't have to thickness your stock exactly to the dimension mm -hmm. of that dado. So fitting it is a lot easier. You just do a narrower dado when you get together your shelf stock and then you just rabbit that thing to fit. That's really good. The second thing on a rabbited dado is on a regular dado, um, the reference surface is the bottom of the dado, right? Okay. So if you're running a dado and there's a little bit of a bow or, or cup or you have some inconsistent height or depth to that dado, it's going to throw off your case dimensions. Where a rabbited dado, the reference surface is the shoulder of the rabbited piece of the shelf itself. So mm -hmm. that way you can actually run a dado slightly deeper. And then as you rabbit your shelf, those shoulders set the distance between the parts. So it's a lot easier to get a much more square, mm. accurate case glue up as well as making it easier to fit your pieces. There's a lot Chapter of ways of two. doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Drink. <laughs> Speaking of, everybody's still recording. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Question number two. We've got some juicy ones today. This one is from Scott. And I think his question got cut off a little bit. So I added some. <laughs> Dima. Um <laughs> I've been buying S4S lumber, and I was wondering how long it would take to pay off buying a combo jointer planer machine with the <laughs> savings. While I'm sure it would be nice to have, am I ever going to save enough money to make it financially worth it? So, jointer, planer, we're looking at even separate machines, lunchbox, you're looking at a grand or so to... Uh, Get Minimum. into the game of okay. milling your lumber, right? But he's talking a combo, right? Well, yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> so we're talking uh, three plus, 3,000 plus? I think they could be had for two-ish. And okay. there's, what's that Rikon 10-inch? Uh, uh, no, Vic, sorry. no, no, there's, yeah. there's, there's a new one that Vic was raving about. I haven't seen that, and I don't want to comment on that a long time ago. I was entranced by smaller, low-cost combo machines. So yeah. I think yeah. I made Raleigh do a review of it for the magazine. Yeah. And um, the larger ones perform better. Also, if uh -huh. I'm going to do that, you're getting double duty out of your cutter head. So I would definitely want a segmented carbide cutter head for that. Oh, um, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so I think maybe see. that's why I was kicking up the price a little bit. So, yeah. Like, you're looking at for... The heavy cast iron ones, not the, yeah. a lot of the old ones were uh, aluminum, like, yeah. like bent aluminum. Um, you're looking at about two grand for a uh -huh. 10 inch with helical head. Oh, cool. Okay. That's not bad. It's like a 10 inch joiner. It's, <laughs> it's two grand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the one thing is you go, you know, you, you price out an eight inch joiner and that's one thing, but then you kick it up to a 12 inch joiner. That's super expensive. Oh yeah. And then that's where the combo 12 inch combo get joiner and planer 12 inch. That's all. I think when the money equation starts to make a little bit more sense. And also if, if you're super cramped for space and you don't mind changing out between joining and planing, um, it's a good way to go. That I mean, that's why I've had combos on, on the brain just cause I realized that my joiner takes up more room than any other piece of equipment and gets used the least for yeah. me. Yeah. And that, that imbalance bothers me, but yeah. I don't have two grand. Um, well, I mean, is a parsec and a light year, are both of those um, <laughs> like functions of distance or is a parsec a time thing? I only know. I, I'm trying I to remember hear parsec you. From, I don't know. From like AP Star Wars. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's only Star Wars, right? Is it only Star Wars? Is it Star Wars about uh, that? Only, I did that in 3.9 parsecs or something like that. Was yeah, that what was the Millennium Solo Falcon? Thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The run. Oh, my yeah. God. The Kessel so, run. Like, Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs? Yeah. So my, my yeah. point is that <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a long uh, unit of time, I guess. Um, <laughs> 
I think it'd be if you're sort of talking about like a somehow a material savings between buying rough sawn lumber and S4S lumber. I don't know if there's enough difference there, but I also don't think that should dissuade you from making an argument for having a joiner and planer because I think there are a lot of huge benefits um, for that. It certainly opens you up for you know the freedom to custom thickness parts you know, various parts. So you're not always working with that sort of three quarter minus S4S surface, which is, I think, a horrible dimension. Um, it can be too clunky for a small piece and it could be undersized for like a full size piece. So mm-hmm. um, that alone. So I, I don't know if, it, if it's necessarily a cost consideration as a what do you want to be making? Um, <laughs> That that was the note I wrote down. Like S four S seems good for knocking stuff out, mm-hmm. maybe like entry level. But S four S, I never consider that like milled the way I want it to be milled. You know, it's just yeah. cleaned up, <laughs> yeah, and to a certain thickness, and that's it. Could still be cupped and twisted, like go sure. into yeah Home so Depot you... and pick up a one by anything, and it's not. Right. Idea. Yeah, but you just don't buy those. So um, you want to site down your pre-surface lumber and look for straight stuff. I think that's doable. I think adding just a benchtop planer to that equation is really good. Yeah. Because if you're not having to flatten stuff, the planer is at least going to be able to get you to different thicknesses. Or you can then bandsaw, you know, parts to different thickness and then run those through the planer. That would be okay. Um, I used to buy... I think it was 13 sixteenths lumber, you know? So I was buying it from a hardwood dealer uh, and they sold it so expecting you to mill it after it left the building, but it was um, straight line ripped and um, relatively flat depending on the board. And I was able to get away with that for building lots and lots and lots of things. The thing that that you you're losing is the ability to dictate grain as much. Um, for me, the ability to take a big board and rip it at the bandsaw along a grain line and follow that grain and dictate where the grain flows on a part. Chapter and then one. take it <laughs> <laughs> and then take it to the joiner. That is, that is the big gain for me. Yeah. It, it's not necessary because you, you really can get by buying nice lumber, mindfully selecting it. And with a planer, I think um, there's lots of ways of getting around edge joining. Um, but the ability to like dictate where the grain goes on a part. I don't know if I could live without that now. Yeah. That's, that's where my jointer wins. Yeah. And you can certainly get by without a planer too. If you have a bandsaw, you can certainly rip parts to thickness and then get out your hand planes, scribe the edges and and plane them down. You know, that gets back to that kind of, can you do everything with hand tools? Yeah, you can. Um, Yeah. But, you know, he started it by saying joiner planer combo. So we're just. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, the sentence cut off right there. So maybe he had a sudden realization like, wait, I'm crazy. Yeah. And yeah. You might be thinking that if you get like a log milled up or something and then you're paying, you know, one or two bucks a board foot and you're saving a ton of money there, you know, then you have to account for the drawing time. And you also have to account for, yeah, but you're not buying one or two boards at two bucks a board foot. You're buying 800 or board feet at two bucks a board foot. <laughs> yeah, so tree it, of board foot. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's still a you know sizable outlay in the beginning. You've got, in essence, you've got free lumber after that, but um, it's all an equation. I, I, I think the biggest thing in terms of time and value is the time you're spending making stuff. You know, how much is that worth to you in terms of, you invest a lot of time and effort in the shop to make something. What are those results? And is it something that, yeah, that was a good investment in my time? Or is it something that was impacted by, well, I got around it by this and I got around it by this. And you end up to what you're saying, Ben, you end up with stuff where 
you didn't control the grain, you didn't necessarily control the thickness of the parts, and you have something that was just, you know, okay, and it does its job versus something that really sings. And I, you know, for me personally, that's that's a big deal. And to go back to the, you can do anything with hand tools thing. Like I don't have a jointer. And if I don't, jointing a face takes a lot of effort sometimes. And if I don't want to do it, I'm waiting, you know, like then I'm not going into the shop that day because mm. I do not want to sweat over like boards. Yeah. Right and when the summer hit and, and whereas if I had a joiner, you just take it to the joiner and that's it. And there's no like struggling with edge joining this long board because you, and so that's another benefit to having a machine. I know it gets away from like, that's different than buying S4S. It's a different kind of concern, but if you're considering a machine and you have the money in the space, like do it. <laughs> they rock, you know? Yeah. I, I, I remember doing the math on this though and, and just being broke and thinking, oh, probably telling my wife, well, if I, if I buy a jointer, I could save a lot of money. And then like, as it was coming out of my mouth, I knew the math was not going to add up. Like, it was just like, this is, and I, I did the math. I, I realized it was like, oh, this is, you know, hundreds of board feet. And it's just, that is not the reason to buy a jointer. Um, that is the reason to buy a planer. Do you remember what you said to me during my job interview, Ben? Yes, I remember it, everything. It was like the getting to know Barry kind of thing. Like, so how'd you get started? <laughs> And it was the, I wanted a spice rack and I didn't want to buy one. Like these are easy to make. And so I figured I could save some money and make one. And at like, as I was ending my sentence, like as the period was, you know, going into place and Ben just jumped in and you know, that's BS, right? Because you haven't saved any money at all getting into this hobby. And I said, yeah, not a, thing. Not a penny. You know? I think that was my first woodworking meme. The domino, like <laughs> the I can't domino, afford yeah. a coffee yeah. table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so it's it's time for segments who well, wants to go first mike did not come up with anything he's been working on his book go ahead barry ah oh, man um i guess favorite technique i'm gonna go with favorite technique because a smooth move is just embarrassing <laughs> um i bareface tenons I haven't said this before yet, right? I for, but, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're just wicked easy to fit. So Ex when I ex explain a bare face tenon. So a bare face tenon. So a tenon, like when you think of one, it's all like a protrusion in the middle of a board, and there mm -hmm. are little. A bare face tenon is like a fat rabbit that makes a tenon. Only one face has a shoulder. Okay. The rest is in. So like the back of the tenon is in line with the back face of the board. Um, and I love them for, because they're easier to fit. So when I only need to worry about that front shoulder being tight, I'm doing a bare face tenon because then you just have to get the two front faces. So they're not out of wind. So they're coplanar. And then to think, thickness the tenon to make it fit the mortise, I just plane down, you know, uh, carefully that back face to uh, thickness you, it in. Okay. And so the, the, the front face is always your reference. Right. The, the front back face, face. Okay. That's the one I change. And it makes, I'm not sure if this is just a hand tool only thing, but like, cause I can't take it back to the table. So after raising the blade a little bit or moving the jig over to kind of skim the faces, um, and keeping a tenon centered. So, because I'm working by hand, bare face tenons, like I did them on my workbench with these big fat tenons, mm -hmm. did them on a weird towel rack. And it's just, when I only have to worry about that front shoulder, bare face makes things a lot easier to work with. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, get lazy people. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was going to last night I I had one um I'm doing an online Fusion 360 course. Okay. And I was going to use that as like my favorite technique or whatever. But face tenons? <laughs> but last <laughs> night it 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 went off the rails and I couldn't 
I couldn't like tell people about it anymore. Um, but Fusion 360 is uh, for those who don't know, it is a um, it's a CAD CAM program. It's similar to SketchUp, um, but a lot more powerful. It is free as well. But um, oh. if uh, if you are strictly a woodworker, SketchUp is all you're ever gonna need. I really believe that unless you're like into commercial, um, like, uh, Greg Pilati shop uses fusion 360 so that they can have a table design and change the dimensions of it. And it, it automatically adds styles along the, you know, or, or oh, whatever. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, there's, there's, this is where I'm diving in right now is there, it's, it's parametric. So you can, change <laughs> you you can change a dimension and so you would say the width is x the length is x times point one point three or whatever so then when you change the width the length of something changes or if you reach a threshold the thickness of something changes so you're you you can get really really detailed with this and i've been using it for 3d printing and i've been really wanting to get better at it so i started using it for woodworking stuff as well just to get the muscle memory going um the the online course that i was that i was taking uh is a little outdated and there's a, there's a point where fusion got updated and nothing matches anymore and it's like dude this isn't this isn't working um but then also last night i decided to open up sketchup for something quick mm -hmm. and all of a sudden i don't know how to operate sketchup anymore it oh, is yeah. entirely oh, foreign and i'm just but like i used to have sketchup chops like like dave richards videos and i are tight and I could fly through SketchUp. I did Chris Gochner's Enfield Cupboard. I did the SketchUp in like 20 minutes just sitting there. I, I, got, I got chops with SketchUp. And all of a sudden, all of the key commands and all of the Zoom settings and all of this are, my mind is triggering to Fusion 360. Um, so I don't know if I have a technique or if this is a smooth move of like I've I dove too far into this other pool and I can't get out now, but I love fusion 360 incredibly powerful, but I am, I'm in, I'm in a struggling point right now and everybody's going to send me, um, the online course that they're taking right now. And I gotta, I gotta soldier on with what I'm doing and try and get through this. And thank you for suggestions. People have been sending me stuff on Instagram, but do you plan on transitioning like away from SketchUp? To Fusion Three, like, can you get stuff done quickly? If like, uh, ooh, that's a good question. I don't think you can. And here's the problem with Fusion Three Hundred and Sixty: is where I am right now. It's like you almost have to have a drawing and dimensions written out already. It's not a place for sketching no. or trying stuff. I think no kidding. I, th I think it's kind of a a thing because you wind up going so far down because you can make the thing model like totally mm -hmm. and you can move parts and have them you could have gears if you wanted and see if things mechanically work and it'll tell you how much the thing is going to weigh and all of that stuff right but if you want to and last night that's exactly what i what i was doing so i'm gearing up for this presentation for Vix thing. And I just needed like a drawing of a case piece with different joinery. I was like, Oh, let me just open up SketchUp and do it real quick. Because that is, if you want to just like get something out there, get an idea or dimensions real quick, maybe test out something SketchUp. Absolutely. The way to go. If you want to be able to send something to a manufacturer and have a million of them done up, you're going to have to go into fusion, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's cool. my, that's my segment. Cool. Mike, I gave you plenty of time. Yeah, you did. Thanks very much. I appreciate <laughs> that. You were like really more Ben, more good. <laughs> well, 
I've definitely mentioned this before because it's totally awesome. I'm bringing it up again because I had just made a little uh, side chair, little arts and crafts dining chair. That came out of nowhere, by the way. Right? Yeah. It was like all of a sudden, I was like, oh, Mike made a chair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the tricky thing about a chair is just dealing with the off-angle joinery. And the first time I was I was doing it, I thought, oh, you actually have to me- measure it and draw a plan and get out your bevel gauge and figure out how to do angled tenons or angled shoulders and all this stuff. And I kind of stumbled on something um, – which I guess is a pretty traditional thing, according to Bob Van Dyke, who kind of burst my balloon when I told him how awesome my my <laughs> idea was. Um, you basically draw out your uh, a top view of your seat with the angled uh, side rails to whatever angle you want. It doesn't matter, and then just make a wedge which is equal to that angle. And then you can use the wedge to do everything. Number one, without even knowing what that angle is, and without having to tilt your table saw blade or do anything. Everything is just automatic. So you have this wedge, which is equal to the angle. You stick that on your crosscut sled and you can cut the ends of your side stretchers, your side rails to that proper angle. And then you can stick that thing to your tenoning jig and cut your tenons to that exact angle. And then I use a spacer to, to set my tenon width. So I do all of my angled uh, tenon joinery with just a wedge and then it just sort of keeps coming into play in unexpected ways throughout the whole build so um it's it's that and i told this to bob because i discovered this in my shop on my own he goes uh yeah it's called the master wedge mike <laughs> oh, shoot um but it, it is a, a super super cool technique um and it just it takes like all the horde things about making a chair out of the equation and it just makes it as easy as making anything else. Um, so really what it comes down to is on a chair, it's how are you going to get that upholstered seat? Are you going to do it yourself or have someone do it? That's kind of what it, what it boils down to. <laughs> I, uh, I use the wedge chapter five <laughs> upholster your seat or your chair or not. <laughs> I use the the wedge um, fixing my my parents' dining chairs, and uh, I didn't have the angle. There was no reference or anything, um, but I needed to do mortises. I either wanted to do them straight or I needed to do angle mortises to match what was already there, and it would be a heck of a lot easier if I could do straight mortises. Um, so what I wound up doing was taking the, the piece with the – the end grain face was cut at the angle. I took the piece and I put it against a one, two, three block and I raised it up until that piece was flush with the one, two, three block marked where the, where the bottom of that piece laid and then transferred that angle onto a piece of three quarter stock band sawed it out. And I just used that shim on the bottom of everything fixing these chairs cool. and all of my mortises were just dom- straight dominoes now. Um, and you just got to nail the height and that's it. It was like that master wedge, even when you're repairing something, yeah. that, oh, I have cool. no idea what the angle was, right? but I just transferred that angle to space and then there you go. <laughs> cool. Nice. Cool. All right, let's take a break. This episode is sponsored by Maverick Abrasives. Maverick is a family-run company that's been making sanding belts and discs for woodworkers in the USA for 30 years. With Maverick, you're buying factory direct, so you're likely to save a lot of money. I just looked around my shop at the various abrasives that I use, and I did the math. If I bought everything directly from Maverick, I would save around 40% on my sanding discs and belts. Maverick has all of the popular size belts and discs in stock on their website, but they can also make any custom sizes that you might need. Check out their website at maverickabrasives.com or give one of their owners, Garrett, a call at 714-646-3299 and use the code FINEWOODWORKING. That's one word, Fine Woodworking, for 10% off your order. Again, that's maverickabrasives.com and the code is FINEWOODWORKING. 
If you love this podcast, you'll love Fine Woodworking Unlimited. Access more than 40 years of articles, how-to videos, and project plans designed to take your craft to the next level. Check it out. Okay, question number three is from Pete. I'm ready to buy a bandsaw. Congratulations, Pete. I have narrowed my choice to two models, one with cast iron wheels and trunnions and one with cast aluminum wheels and trunnions. Is there an advantage to one over the other? Does it even matter? So this is between Grizzly and Laguna. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Ben, your Grizzly has cast iron wheels, right? Yeah. I just assumed but, that the Laguna had a, aluminum, but I don't know. Yeah, God, I don't. I don't well, so, so Grizzly, like my Grizzly, the 055, the one that everybody under the age of 45 has, um, you either have the 055 LX or the 055 or the 055, the black and orange one, whatever. Um, but, uh, I got the LX cause it had cast iron wheels. And at the time I was like, that sounds better and it's more expensive. So, and I can afford it. So that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like oh. I don't. Certainly there's an issue of mass, I think is a good thing. I would um, think. But like, for instance, like I mentioned Grizzly and Laguna, like for instance, if they had like different wheels, I'm not sure that would be the deciding factor between choosing. Cause I think they both have some really good bandsaws. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I would, I think I would look at, at other things. I don't, so I consulted sure would... Roland Johnson's complete illustrated guide to bandsaws. Cause I also yeah. did not know. Although, anecdote or fun story, Ben just helped me move a bandsaw into my shop. And he was like, listen, you're going to need help. Let's take it apart. It's a total drag. I bled all over that thing. (laughs) You really did. And on my bathroom door. There was blood on my bathroom door. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. What is this guy? So, no wonder you didn't accept money when I tried to pay. You're like, no, you're going to have to clean up my biohazard. Um. So Ben's like, you're going to need some help. Let's take it apart. We'll take the upper. I don't know what it's called. The upper assembly, the spine and upper wheel. Yeah. It's like a name. He's like, it's wicked heavy. I promise I've done it twice moving my band. So I promise I'd never do it again. We take it off and I'm like carrying around the upper thing, like in one arm, like just kind of on my shoulder. And he goes, no, no, what is it? <laughs> and the difference is the bandsaw that I just brought in has aluminum wheels and Ben's has cast iron, but Ben's look of like, you have, you have little spaghetti arms. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and so there's that if you're worried about movability, but Roland Johnson and his complete illustrated guide to bandsaws says cast iron wheels are heavier, which gives them a flywheel effect. And this is a more consistent blade speed, or this lends itself to a more consistent blade speed in materials of different densities. Um, whereas aluminum wheels reach maximum speed faster, a benefit with small saws. And so I guess if you're like different densities, if you're doing a lot of like Southern yellow pine, you know, it'll keep that huh. flywheel effect. Um, and I'm, I was with, not that this guy's about to buy like a 30 inch bandsaw, but I was with Gary Rogowski and he was showing me around a shop and he has this enormous, I think a Yates thing. And it was, two minutes to get to full speed. He's like, turn it on. And I'm just look, looking at him and he's like, nodding his head smiling. And I'm looking at him. He's nodding his head smiling. It was like a bad joke. Like if, like if there's a shaggy dog story of band sauce, it was that. I'm like waiting for that to start up. Um, but the trunnions seem more. I would, I would like, be weary of aluminum iron. trunnions. I would. Yeah. I, that's, and I've never thought of aluminum trunnions. Mm-hmm. Um, and man, like functionally, is it really going to matter? I would, we took the trunnions off, off your bandsaw and just cause I was worried about them breaking, you know, cause if those break, you're done. That's, you're not going to find another set of trunnions for that saw or, yeah. or whatever. Um, that's the only reason why I think I'd be weary of aluminum trunnions, but the more I think about it, I could be swayed that it doesn't matter. 
So Raleigh Johnson also has an opinion on this. Why why are we asking this crew? I really missed the mark on this one. Mike's like, no opinion. And Barry's just reading Raleigh's book. I'm trying yeah, no, I'm trying to find it <laughs> verbatim, but he does a hierarchy. Here we go. Hefty cast iron trunnions are best, period. Die cast units are not as reliable, and sheet steel trunnions are even less so. And like I didn't do a full dive. Like I just looked at the claw or index and but it it wasn't like pros and cons. It was, you know, cast iron, die cast, sheet steel. So, so what are the things that you look for in a bandsaw, Mike? Uh, foot break. Oh, yes, man. Yes. I, I turned off that. the one I just got. I was like, oh, no foot break. Yeah, Sometimes. 100%. Yeah, especially when you talk about the wheel taking two minutes to come to full <laughs> speed. It's going to take mm-hmm. two minutes to slow down. Oh, yeah. And, and a silent two minutes. Like, yeah. that's what wigs me out. Yeah. yeah, you turn that's around, a, it's like, that's still trying to kill me? Uh-huh. It, it will <laughs> silently kill you just as fast as if the motor was on. Um, yeah. Um, I have. Do you, ever, a, do, do you ever go and make an extra cut with it off? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I'll turn it off and, and it'll still be spinning. I'll be like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't anymore because uh, the Grizzly Bandsaw I have, it has an electric motor brake. Oh, cool. As well. So like when you turn off the switch, uh, I don't think I even have a foot pedal. I don't think, I don't know. Yours don't. does stop like instantly. Yeah. It's like you hit the stop and boom, the blade stops. There's like an electronic brake that engages. So there's, yeah. there's nothing. Um, there's And there's two different type of foot pedals. One also has a little electric switch in it. So it turns mm-hmm. off the motor and you can stop, which is super nice. Other types, um, they won't stop the motor, so you got to be sure to turn off the saw and then stop it. But either way, any method of stopping the blade more quickly, I think, is a really good and necessary thing, especially once you start to get to larger bandsaws. You know, I have a 17-inch bandsaw, so I'd say 17-inch and up is going to take a long time for that wheel to power down. And if you're buying a saw, I think it's super important. Just make the investment in some sort of foot switch or electronic brake. I think that's yeah. definitely important thing. Yeah. You're probably not going to find, well, maybe like, like the, uh, the Laguna, like the big 14 BX Laguna that everyone has, uh, it's a 14 inch and it does have a, a a foot pedal. Oh, that one's actually got like a brake caliper or something. Doesn't I? That's cool. Yeah. Like a bicycle (laughs) caliper, brake caliper. Um, but most 14s, like the old Delta cast iron styles aren't going to have a foot brake. Um, my, Grizzly Delta knockoff doesn't have a foot brake and it really takes a surprising amount of time to Mm -hmm. spin down. Not as much as the, the, uh, disc sander, but, um, I think I used to worry about resaw capacity more than anything. Sure. Um, and that's why I got this saw cause I could afford it and it had, I could get a riser block for it. And I don't think I have ever resawed more than the original six inch, Resaw. And if no I have, kidding. it's been six and five eighths, you know? And yes, I was happy to have the riser block on that one, but um, no, I don't think so. Anytime I resawed big stuff, it was at the old shop and I used that machine. Yeah. In my head, that's like priority two or three. But then I remember dust collection has not been priority one for me. And resawing that much without dust collection feels like. Like I'm going to be have like I need a neti pot attached to my face for the next day or two just to yeah. move out the mess. It, until you get into the euro, you know the big, the euro style, the big bandsaw, sixteens or whatever, or the fourteen BX Laguna. Um, I don't think any of them have the power to really be re- You know, it's got twelve inch resaw capacity, but it's yeah, not going to be able to resaw yeah. twelve inches. Right. Yeah. yeah. So adding a riser block to a little three quarter horse fourteen inch bandsaw might not be able to do it for you that's what i did i the delta 14 inch added the riser block and by far the biggest difference between that saw and moving up to the grizzly 17 inch which is the euro style cabinet sheet metal cabinet um is just i think the rigidity of the guide post and the frame um maybe i keep sharper blades in there now also blade tensioning is a big issue on a 14 inch saw Really, I think like a three-eighth inch blade is about the maximum that you could tension adequately. 
Whereas mm -hmm. on a bigger saw, I have a half inch blade in there all the time. Super tension is not an issue. And I just find with a half inch blade, um, I don't know, maybe a more rigid frame, maybe a better um, guide bearing setup. But resawing is super easy. I remember it used to be this big headache and it was this really tough decision when I was having to resaw something on the smaller bandsaw. And now it feels like I'm spending half my time at the bandsaw resawing and it's no big deal. Okay. I just it just tells me if my blade needs to be changed out or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but if it's tracking straight good, if it just starts to wind side to side a little bit, new blade. And yeah. it's Perfect every time. Uh, Tim cool. Rousseau was saying one time that the uh, half inch or even a three quarter inch blade, he thinks that one of the biggest um, bonuses is that the heat doesn't build up in in the blade as much. Oh, interesting. So you're able to get more life out of the blade. Um, it's it's not uh, warping in the cut. Um, and I've never thought of that. And I keep a quarter inch on the saw and I, I do resaw with a quarter inch. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but again, you know, four or five inches of resaw is where I'm maxing it out. Right. Um, it can do it. It's fine. It really is just not something I look forward to. Uh, right. I, uh, that's about the only saw that, or the only machine that I really one day would like to get a 16 or 17 or whatever, like whatever fits right under that ceiling right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I can't find the question. There we go. All right. Question number four. This is an interesting one. It's an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> From Bob. I've been reading through the old fine woodworking issue archives that I bought. There have been a lot of tool and machine tests over the years. How far back can I go and still use the tool test recommendations? I know that tools and machines are updated periodically, not as often as consumer products, though. Would recommendations for hand tools stay longer than for machines? So, I almost thought we should, like, break it down. Like, like so, I've got the tools and material editor here and the editor, so, gentlemen... Well, if on eBay you see like a Delta Joiner from 1986 and you pick up an issue of Fine Woodworking from 1986 to read that review. No, seriously, I think that's- I've, I've done that with dust collectors, yeah. I have too, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, I think that's good. But to say that, you know, a Joiner reviewed in 1986, how it equates to something in, you know, 2021 um, may or may not be appropriate and most likely not. So Barry, you go through this a lot because you're our tools and materials guy mm -hmm. and anybody who's done reviews, you know, you've got to say, okay, when was the last time we did this? Okay. We did this five years ago. Okay. These three companies still have a joiner, but the model name has changed. It looks the same, but something yeah. is different. So I guess that's a question to you. Okay. So I read a review on joiners the last time we printed it, let's say it was four years ago and I'm looking at joiners now and none of the model numbers add up exactly, but it looks pretty close. Can I trust that old review or not? With that. So that'll happen where like, do I, I decide, do I review this tool or is it just like a, co is it just kind of a little update like cosmetic, right. you know? Yeah. yeah. And so when I do, when that happens, I kind of turn to specs. Like horsepower, capacity. Um, sometimes if the original review was not terribly favorable, you know, it'd be like, well, maybe the updates gave this thing a second life somehow. Yeah. But if the numbers kind of look equal and the original review is favorable, I kind of think, why? You know, like what, what was improved that isn't crystal clear in a press release or looking at it that's where I kind of think maybe this is just like a new paint job or cooler shapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm assuming that's how it was handled in the past. <laughs> I've never. Yeah, pretty much. Off. And I think to his point, something like, um, well, a jointer, let's stay on that example. It's a pretty basic piece of machinery. There's not a lot of bells and whistles. You got a mold, you know, you got a cutter head, pulleys, a motor and belts. Yeah. In feet out feet table cast iron everything you know probably that technology really hasn't changed quite a bit 
um, something like combination machines or even bandsaws. You know, I think a company like Laguna seems to me to have done like a lot of research and development, a lot of improvements on their saws. So I would probably say, you know, in 18 year old, 14 inch Laguna or 10 year old, 14 inch Laguna review versus today, it might be a completely different saw. Mm -hmm. Could be. So I don't know. Um, things like, like miter saws. I feel like those, there's a new model number sure. every year. Yeah. yeah. You know, power tools are the worst. Yes. It, like, like a drill, like, Oh, is it the Milwaukee boost 1520 pro or is it the DeWalta DeWalta? <laughs> Where do you shop? Definitely we're doing that one. <laughs> but you know, it's like, they just, a part of me thinks that, Maybe some manufacturers change the model number so that certain specs can't follow it right <laughs> into the into the future. I don't right. know, but um, machinery is going to stay fairly consistent. Fit and finish aspects are probably going to be somewhat consistent from uh, within brands. I would think um, hand tools, though, they're fairly evergreen, right? Well, I mean, a 1940s Stanley plane versus a 1990s Stanley plane. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pretty big. That's, so, that's a that's a fairly but a 20 year old Lee Nielsen plane versus now. It's, it's be probably the same. Yeah. yeah. And I think I ret I treat reviews at least like our head to heads where it's a whole class of planers or whatever differently than I do the one shots if I'm doing personal research. Like so long as I'm not looking for the best of the best, then if 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 it was a good planer in 1994, I'm assuming it's a good planer now. Like people's standards haven't changed that much, except for helical cutter heads. But people kind of admit that, you know, like that is a known quantity. Where I don't think someone will go, oh, that's a crappy planer from 1994 because it doesn't have because it has straight knives. Like, I don't think that's, I think people can filter that out, you know? Yeah. So a recommendation feels like a recommendation, even if it isn't as good as something today. But if something like a 2016 planer that's reviewed well, or as well as a 1994 planer, if they're the same price, I'm assuming someone's buying the newer one, you know? So it almost feels... Yeah. yeah, like you can trust the old reviews. Sorry, go on. No, I was I was gonna say like planers, um, jointers. Well, jointers. There's really not much to a jointer. A bandsaw. There's not all that much to a bandsaw other than you know fit and finish of the trunnions and specs and wheel weight. A jointer though is like it is a motor attached to a spinny thing, and as long as you can get the beds. To line up and that, but that's where, that's where you're going to separate them is how easily can you get those beds to line up and stay lined up. Right. Um, and I think that fit and finish, you know, they might change the model number due to a cutter head change or they might have to, or whatever, or it's a new knob, but probably, you know, like, um, parallel bed joiners are, are going to be better than non-parallel bed joiners. So, Mike, I have a question for you. There's, and we talked about it recently on Slack, that at some point, table saws, like home woodworker level table saws, you kind of expected their fence wouldn't lock square, mm -hmm. right? So, was that a given? Like, was that something that would go without saying in reviews from... I don't know when the like good fences got introduced, like eighty mid eighties. Yeah, I mean the Delta Unisaw, you know the the three horse ten inch Delta mm -hmm. Unisaw that was the table saw to get, and it came with this jet lock fence, which was notorious for not squaring <laughs> up when you moved it, and it just was, and All you right. just lived with it. But it was completely acknowledged because it was the only saw that you were going to buy. So it was acknowledged. It wasn't. Sure. It was acknowledged. Okay. But Nobody then, expected a, f a fence to be parallel. 
Well, you would buy a Beesmeyer aftermarket fence. Oh, okay. Okay. So and, and gotcha. this was like early eight. I don't know when Beesmeyer fences came out, but it was probably, well, there was a whole market of aftermarket rip fences. I and bet. I think it was- You look through it, archive issues. Yeah. Yes, we did yeah. it. And it was a cottage industry based on everyone having a Unisaw with a crappy fence on it. That's awesome. <laughs> that is super fascinating. Okay. But it was- known where like a review for that unisaw wouldn't not mention the un- like the subpar fence you know what i mean i don't know or it would just be taken for granted oh and of course the fence is horrible no, okay i don't know. Yeah, that, that, I guess, I like no okay but yeah so, it was a known issue and it was and now of course you know every fence sells a beastmeyer style mm-hmm. uh, every saw has a beastmeyer style fence to it so yeah. okay but yeah, we did a review. I think we got, it's how I got my first decent fence is that I think we had, I don't know, 10 or 12 table saws. So anybody with a table saw that they could do without for a few months, get out. we shipped them to um, the wood shop and we had one poor guy install a different rip fence onto all of them. And there were some really weird, like cable and pulley driven things. There's a lot right because you got to be different solutions. Like, yeah, I I went to look at a friend. Had, his neighbor was selling a bunch of old tools, and he was like, "Oh, come over." And I looked, and he had this huge Powermatic, uh, green Powermatic, and there was like cables run all throughout the fence. It was like a drafting yes thing. Yeah. And I was like. What is this thing? <laughs> wow. I think there was a Vega fence that was pretty popular, but that had like the cables and pulleys stuff going on. And the fence I got out of that, Ben, was a fence that was still on saw. was the Delta Unifence, which is fantastic. I That's love cool. that. Oh, there it is right there. Mm-hmm. I missed that. I love um, that fence. I really do. Yeah. It's, it's a super great design. And of course, um, you know, Delta doesn't manufacture or sell that anymore, which is too bad. But uh, that was like, that was in the era of, okay, let's start from scratch and come up with a cool fence. And it's such a bizarre thing, but it's wonderful. Yeah. Huh. So reviews, yeah, it's, it's case by case, right? Yeah. Honestly, um, you know, I just bought a new espresso machine. Uh, (laughs) That's not in my book, so that's okay. But of course, you know, I didn't even think of looking up, you know, vintage espresso machine magazines to look at five-year-old reviews. It's just like you go online, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that said, I didn't go right to like Amazon and look at the reviews. I went to top espresso machines for 2020, you know, and read all those. <laughs> and then you have to parse through, okay, which of these are advertorials? Which of these are strong? And then you cross-reference and you Which read, these are and SEO then you go trackers. to Amazon, and then you cross-reference those reviews. And did they get a one star because um, it never showed up? So right. one star, oh. you know, versus this is, you know, the first one about three years ago. This is my second one. And yeah, after three years, this seal begins to leak and you could either pay this much to the factory to get it fixed or get a new, you know, like that kind of stuff. I I Mm -hmm. tend to trust. I like those longevity things. Um, But it's just like five stars. I just got it and can't wait to try it. I know. It's like, no, this is not not happening over here. (laughs) Or, you know, some, a woodworking book, one star because the cover was torn. It's like, I'm sorry. I did not do that. We didn't ship it that way. So <laughs> that is not a review. <laughs> um, I had someone recently DM me asking about lathes and I, and it's like, and they were asking about the lathe that we used in the um, learning curve video series. And I was like, it's a great lathe, but I was on it for a day and I'm not the guy to ask yeah. about anything about lathes. Sure, you know, there's a reason right. why I was in that video was because it was about learning how to use a lathe. And um, so a part of me, I, I told him, I was like, you, you need to reach out to so-and-so or see who has the lathe that you're looking at. He, and he was talking about $2,300 lathes. And I was like, I... I, I don't buy $2,300 cars, you know, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I do, but, um, I'm, I'm not the guy to ask. 
there, but if you see someone with, with a thing and they've had it for a while, chances are they've got a pretty good opinion about it. You know, there's a piece of equipment in my shop that I really don't like. And, um, I actually have on a piece of tape, it says not great on it because I don't want someone to see it and be like, Oh, well, Ben uses it. So whatever. (laughs) It's just like, it's just the one I have right now. Um, but Ask around, I guess, you know, don't, don't be shy. I'm opening up the door for woodworkers all over the world to answer these DMS about their whatevers. But I think a lot of people are going to be honest with you too. So, yeah. All right. Let's see. We've got a couple of listener comments. Um, first one is from iceberg. I've been a listener since the beginning and the podcast just continues to be top notch best woodworking podcast. And this one is from Chuck78390362910. Five-star estimation. And part of this I agree with, part of this I don't agree with. I subscribed to the magazine for the sole purpose of keeping this podcast going, as I have really enjoyed the bonus episodes throughout the pandemic. (laughs) I wish the... That's incredible. (laughs) I wish the higher-ups, and he has it pronounced... (laughs) Pekovich, <laughs> I don't agree with this, would reduce Mr. Ben's workload so that this could be a regular thing. And then the reason why I'm reading this, I really just want to stop listening to FHB every week to get my Jeff fix. <laughs> and we're going to have Jeff coming back on once we get through this Zoom pandemic junk. I'll be happy, so happy when Jeff is back with us. Uh, all right. So, uh, that's it. Anybody have any random recommendations? No, I mean, but that statement falls under the category of like, you would see like a Mercedes Benz for $90,000 and it's like, well, if I had $90,000, then I would go, wait a minute. There's like 20 things I would buy for $90,000 before (laughs) I buy a Mercedes. So that's sort of like Ben, if we freed up Ben with more time, the last thing (laughs) we're going to do is do more podcasts. Uh, Oh, you know what though? This did bring up a question that I have for the audience is, um, nothing like, please nobody freak out, but like, what would, if we did more bonus episodes, audio only, would that be worth it for people? So leave a comment, let us know because that does make things easier. And it's like, you know, for trying to make things easier for podcast production or whatever, to get more content, And there are people that I've been meaning to do individual interview episodes with, all that stuff. Um, It's just a lot to assemble an episode right now. So uh, let me know if if audio only is worthwhile for you. That that is a legitimate question for the audience. Uh, I have a random recommendation. Um, uh, 501 Course Echo on YouTube. Uh, if there's any guitar players out there, uh, this guy, Tom Bukovac, he's, I I used to, I I used to do sessions with him all the time. Um, he, he is not your weedly, weedly, weedly guitar player. Um, he is the, this is how you, this is how you make a record and, and make it sound like a record guitar player. And, um, it's it's educational and it is just him in his garage drinking beer playing in front of an iPhone and 501 chorus echo book vac miss you book all right anybody else um i've been getting into agamator's chess channel <laughs> it's agamator's a, a guy he uh, basically he um has like a little chess board up on screen and he narrates and replays famous chess games. And oh I'm God. not, I'm not like a chess player. I'm like, I would play every six months, mm-hmm. you know, someone thinking I was good, but then like, Oh, I didn't know you could take my queen right there. You know what I mean? I mean, that <laughs> um, I saw the queen's gambit, which was super cool. And that kind of, kind of got me back into it. Um, but this is really good. He, I mean, he narrates it really well. And obviously in a sense, I have no idea what's going on, but I watch it and I feel like, Oh yes, I understand why he couldn't take that pawn with his knight, even though it seems like the obvious choice. It's just, 
<laughs> it's really cool. And what he does, he'll say, now, it might seem like an obvious thing to take that piece right there. I'm going, yeah, that's what I would do. But you'd automatically lose the game. <laughs> what? Because <laughs> it's like, watch, because you do that. This is going to happen. 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 And checkmate. It's like, oh, my God. But anyway, um, I don't know. I, I find them, like, really entertaining if you have, like, any interest in chess whatsoever. Um, it's pretty cool. My my favorite part of the Queen's Gambit was realizing that people study games and look for errors in the, and it's like of course yes. they do that but that yeah, watch the tape that just like, being that, yeah I guess it's, that's what it is wow all right and actually the games on Queen's Gambit those are real like those are real games no yeah. even if they only show three moves it's like all the set up to that all the piece positioning like there's like an okay. entire logic to that gary kasparov was one of the main um yeah. advisors to that who's like a you know grandmaster chess player and everything so um and so this guy he will review the games played on queen's gambit to show you like what the cool things are so i don't know chess. that's awesome uh, yeah uh, barry you have anything uh, um yes yeah, since we're sticking with youtube patrick h willem w-i-l-l-e-m he does really cool, tip, typically movie commentary, but kind of media commentary overall. And he just did like an hour long episode on music in movies. And he said it was called like mic drops, not mic drops, needle drops in movies. And it's like an hour long, dude, you jumped the shark. And last night I was engaged for the whole time. <laughs> like he, he's like, there's a diegetic and non-diegetic. But if you want to talk about subjective and objective, and he's really smart and engaging without seeming like a jerk you know like it's very and even his media topics are not citizen kane you know he'll talk about the color palette in the mcu or so it's very like pop culture hmm. and he's he's really really good cool <laughs> my watch later queue is just filled with hour-long videos that i'll never watch that's why i only thought only i was i was I mad when he put out an hour-long one nope and then, i think yep. youtube needs to start toning it back down to five ten minutes because that's what i got for you <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have all right. 35 minute long <laughs> uh, that's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live if you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show please send them into shoptalkatalk.com if you're watching on YouTube please click that thumbs up button we'll be back in two weeks with another episode thank you for listening take a deeper dive into woodworking topics when you join the Fine Woodworking Unlimited community from in-depth project guides step-by-step -step plans tips and techniques, you'll find everything you need to master your craft. Try Unlimited now and enjoy a 14-day free trial. Find out more at finewoodworking.com members. <laughs>